Today we're doing a presentation on Piper Alpha and the tragedy the name has become associated with. The presentation today is divided into four parts. The first part is presented by me, Jake. I'll be going through the day-to-day -day running of Piper Alpha. Then I'll hand you on to Matthew to talk about what happened on the night of July 6th, 1988. Followed by Marco, we'll be going through the causes of the accident. And lastly, Jacinta will talk about the lessons that were learned from the disaster. Piper Alpha was originally an oil platform that was operated by a company known as Occidental Petroleum Caledonia Limited, also known as OPCAL. The Piper oil field was discovered in early 1973, followed closely by the fabrication of the platform in the Scottish Highlands. The oil field was located in the North Sea, 120 miles northeast of Aberdeen, a northern Scottish coastal city. On the night in question, there were 228 personnel aboard, including staff on a standby support vessel. Piper Alpha was originally designed with safety in mind. The staff quarters were surrounded by a firewall and kept away from potentially dangerous production areas of the platform. However, in the late 1980s, Piper Alpha was converted so that it could also produce gas and condensate, the condensate being mostly propane. This conversion diminished the original safe design of the platform, bringing together sensitive areas. One such critical example was of a condensate pump that was located near the control room. When production started in 1976, Piper Alpha was producing around 250,000 barrels of oil a day. This quickly increased to 300,000 barrels of oil a day, nearly 10% of the total oil output of the North Sea. During 1988, the production of oil had slowed to 120,000 barrels per day. However, gas was now being produced at a rate of 33 million standard cubic feet per day, and jointly, the total was still 10% of North Sea production. From 1976 to 1988, there was a significant drop in the price of oil, from $30 a barrel to $8 a barrel. Because of this drop, OPCAL had scaled back spending on the platform. Piper Alpha had become a hub, processing its own gas and collecting gas from two other platforms before sending it on to another separate platform. The platforms were Claymore, which was a distance of 21 miles, Tartan, located 16 miles from Piper, and then the joint gas was piped a distance of 33 miles to MCP01. And from there, it was pumped onshore to St Ferguson Gas Terminal, Aberdeen. That's it for me. I'd like to now hand you over to Matthew, who will be speaking about what happened on the fateful night, July 6th, 1988. First of all, I'd like to thank Jake very much for the introduction. Right now, I want to try to paint a picture of how an ordinary night, 226 personnel on board Piper Alpha turned into a disaster that to this day impacts many lives and industry standards around the world. The Northern Sea has a well-earned reputation of being a harsh environment. In the world this, the evening of July the 6th was considered relatively calm by its standards. At 6 p.m. of that night, the night shift began. There were 62 personnel assembled to take full operation of Piper Alpha, while 164 were enjoying their downtime after a day shift. At 9.45 p.m., common safe pump being tripped and could not be reset off multiple restarts. Although this piece of equipment was critical in maintaining power to the platform, it was considered a routine breakdown and a regular occurrence by staff. After multiple attempts at restarting, permission was given to switch to pump A at 9.55 p.m. and immediately a heavy presence of gas was noted on the platform. Gas alarms were activated, however, instantly there was an explosion, damaging the firewall in the vicinity. Emergency stop buttons were activated, although at this stage the explosion had caused ruptures in other lines creating other fires in the area. At 8 minutes past 10, the confinement had to be abandoned due to the ever-increasing fire after a final mayday call was made. While on the lower levels, some men had managed to escape already. There was chaos and disorder for all those who remained trapped on board. With the control room abandoned and no backup on the platform, there was no base established to give any form of direction. Fire blocked access to lifeboat stations, so many staff gathered in the accommodation block awaiting orders. 
Unfortunately for those waiting, no direction is coming. Descended into a situation of each man for himself. Some staff had made their way to the heli deck, over the plane had driven off all helicopters and rescue vessels. Unsuccessful attempts were made by personnel to activate the diesel firefighting system. Some staff were fortunate enough to reach the escape zodiacs and make their way to the rescue vessel in the silver pit. At 10.20 p.m., the first major explosion occurred, and at this stage, it is believed between 20 and 30 of the 226 oil workers had managed to escape. The first assistance for the stricken platform occurs at 10.30 p.m. in the firefighting vessel of the Pharos. At 10.50 p.m., a second massive explosion occurs. The plane reported at 100 metres high in the air, while 187 men were still on board. This drove off the barrels as well as other watercraft in the area assisting the rescue of personnel who had no other chance for survival, with some taking the 170 foot leap into the northern sea from the alley deck and other sections of the reef. At 11.50 pm, the accommodation block as well as the generation and utilities module sank while over 80 men remained trapped inside. All structural collapse was underway. At 45 minutes past midnight, the entire platform was on the ocean floor while the plane load remained burning away. Shockingly, in the space of two hours, the rig had gone from smooth operation to a tragedy which took 165 lives and created a $3.6 billion insurance loss in today's value. To piece together the catastrophic events that caused this disaster, I would like to hand you over to Marco. I thank you for your time. Thanks, Matt. These were unbelievably terrible hours. How could it come to this catastrophic accident? In this part of the presentation, I will explain how an extremely unlikely combination of human errors and design issues were responsible for the worst offshore oil disaster of all times. Let's begin with the primary event that initiated this chain of disastrous events. The initial and primary event was the first explosion caused by the escape of high pressure gas following the starting of condensate pump A. On die shift, the pressure safety valve of this pump was removed for routine maintenance, and the open condensate pipes were temporarily sealed with blind covers. And because the work couldn't be completed during the die shift, these covers remained in place and were hand-tightened only. These diagrams shall explain the maintenance work carried out on condensate pump A. The diagram at the left shows the typical pressure safety valve bolted in location. The picture at the right shows the condensate pipe work without the pressure safety valve. There are both pipes sealed with blind covers, and these blind covers were hand-tightened only. The first instant of human error was the failure to perform an adequate handover to the next shift. The on-duty engineer filled in a permit which stated that pump A was not ready and must not be switched on under any circumstances. At shift changeover, this engineer found the on-duty custodian busy, so he neglected to inform him of the condition of pump A. Instead, he placed the permit in the control center and left. This permit disappeared and was not found. Not aware of the maintenance being carried out, the night shift crew turned on the alternated pump. The blind covers failed to handle the pressure of the gas leading to the first explosion. This explosion destroyed the firewalls. Flying panels of these walls captured the main gas rises, led to several other explosion fires, which prevented the crew members' evacuation. Inadequate assessment of the safety hazards, deficiency in the permit to work system, as well as lack in training in the use of permits were the initial causes leading to this disaster. Also, the automatic firefighting system had been deactivated prior to the incident. The tartan and climber platforms continued to supply oil and gas, despite the flame from Piper being visible to them. If stuff had shut down the supplies to Piper, the fire and subsequent explosion would have been much less severe and may have been limited to the gas model. 
In summary, there were a large number of human errors and design issues. Deficiency in the permit to work system and lack of communication started an accident which spiraled into a disaster. Thank you for your time. Now I'd like to hand you over to Jacinta and the aftermath. Thanks for that, Marco. The aftermath of Piper Alpha was huge. It started off with the Lord Cullen Public Inquiry that concluded in 1990 with 106 key recommendations on how to prevent such a disaster from ever occurring again. In fact, the most key of all these recommendations was the immediate requirement for all offshore installations to, to submit a safety case, which was a document that would go through all safety procedures or hazards that are being identified and how they've been reduced as low as reasonably practicable and all the escape plans and how they would deal with any type of emergency. In fact, operators generally had to spend in the order of a billion dollars to upgrade their facilities in order for all safety cases to be accepted, which took three years in this case. This wasn't the only legislation, though, in the 1990s. There were others such as the prevention of fire and explosions, specifically on offshore installations, and requirements for the design and construction of such facilities. There were public campaigns such as the one that began in 1997, which aimed to reduce all oil and gas safety incidents by 50%, which they did indeed achieve. And finally, the Piper 25 conference in Aberdeen last year, marking the 25th anniversary, was an opportunity for all oil and gas industry stakeholders to gather and determine whether the Piper Alpha legacy has indeed been followed through as well as it possibly could and whether there was anything that people could be doing better. However, Piper Alpha just didn't affect the offshore insulations affected by the UK regulations. It has had a ripple effect across the world and safety in general. We now see companies that have safety first mottos and billboards recording the number of days since the last reportable injuries and come out with other types of visual goals for workers to constantly keep in mind. There is also the requirement for job safety analysis and take fives for workers to complete on either a daily or a weekly basis or even just whenever the hazards are expected to be slightly different and that they need to be identified and managed appropriately as low as reasonably practicable. And finally, safety and design legislation has come across the world since Piper Alpha and has even affected Darwin as recently as two years ago when our legislation was brought into being. And this basically means the design engineer now has a much greater responsibility to focus on identifying possible and future hazards during the construction stage, the decommissioning and the operation stages of the facilities and to reduce those hazards or eliminate them even at the design stage, which is usually the more efficient and cheaper way of undertaking such an exercise. It's important to keep the actual key lessons learned that came out of the Lord Public Inquiry firmly in mind though, so that we know the reason for all the changes to the safety legislation across the world. And they are, number one, continuous and quality training for all workers from the tradespeople through to upper management is a must, as is the continuous hazard identification and management throughout operation and decommissioning stages. And finally, you need to have quality auditing because on Piper Alpha there was plenty of auditing, but it all said everything was fine when it clearly wasn't. In conclusion, the Piper Alpha disaster remains the worst oil and gas disaster in all of history in terms of number of deaths, but the world really has tried to learn from the Piper Alpha legacy, and we've seen that with the ripple effect across the world in the safety revolution of today. However, complacency still and can does creep in, and in fact, Juliet Hackett alluded to the Deepwater Horizon disaster as being the single most unacceptable example of complacency since Piper Alpha. And in fact, I will end off in her words at the Piper 25 conference last year. There are no new accidents, only new people repeating old accidents. <laughs>